Hey guys, welcome back to High and Dry. This week we are talking about the 10 things we wish that we could have told our drunk selves. Yep. We were too drunk to listen. Yeah, we were definitely <laughs> too drunk to listen. Oh, and it's funny no. too, because these 10 things I could always tell myself. Yeah, um, we can still apply them. Absolutely. Like, Originally, Jamie and I talked about the 10 things we wish we could have told our or we learned, in our early 20s. Our 20s yeah. yeah, things we learned in our 20s. But a lot of the stuff really applies to the fact that we had drinking problems mm-hmm. in our 20s. Mm-hmm. So. so we can still apply it now. Still working on some of yeah, these things. Yeah, definitely still working but on But we some really of these could have benefited from some of them when we were drinking. And the truth is, some of them I did, or I'm sure you did too, think about. But we're just not in a space. Not ready to accept. Yeah, or I was all talk. Yeah, and no applicate. I loved yeah, to talk. I always talk. say this, but like... <laughs> I love to do self-help things yeah. that weren't actually yeah. self-help when mm-hmm. I was not doing well. Like I would do mm-hmm. anything but the thing. Yeah. Just talk about it. There's a lot of time. I would talk about it all like well, well, be, when and we the th- were talking about Jay Shetty, ate yeah. him up. Yeah. Like yeah, I would yeah, listen yeah. to Jay Shetty. But the thing I would is read also, the books. This, this, it's scientific how it's like, like stay quiet about things you're working on because in just talking about it, it releases a bit of that like dopamine or a little uh, like you, you got a hit in just talking about it. You feel good so when about you it. Talk, yeah, you, you taught not, me this and it's so cool. Yeah. So when you talk about your goals, you guys, instead of actually doing your goals or you talk about something you want to do instead of doing it, the dopamine that you would get from doing it is released mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. talking about it. So you might never actually even do it. Yeah. But you felt kind of good just talking about it or sharing your goals with other people and you might never execute it mm-hmm. because you've you've been getting that dopamine hit. Yeah. So it's like, stay quiet. Stay quiet Stay low. and focus on focus your Focus on your things and then talk about it when it's like happening or it's happened or it's yeah out there. Yeah, that's an Andrew Huberman right there. Are we Andrew Huberman? I wish. Is he Jewish with a name Would like you, that? Do you think Andrew Huberman's hot? Mm, I he d- is. <laughs> Undeniably. <laughs> no, I, I to be honest, I don't really know too much of what he looks like. like I know his picture he's on just his, like Jack. He's like a big guy. Like I know, and, and he's, he's like manly. A doctor. He's a doctor and he's like so small. Well, he's like, yeah, like a neuroscientist. Imagine going on a date with Andrew Huberman. Uh, just for sitting sure across he could. But what if he didn't see this is the thing? I have I a fantasy like. of going on a date. I know I think he's happily married, but I have a yeah. fantasy. Uh-huh. total fantasy uh-huh. of going on a date with Andrew Huberman and him just talking to me about the most yeah, just interesting things you. for like an hour and a half but I bet he doesn't like talking about that when he's off the probably clock probably not I yeah, bet he wants to talk guy. about oh, like he's baseball. for sure good looking yeah like he's good looking guy oops yeah like he's a good looking guy blue eyes, eyes. yeah and he, has he looks better without now. the beard no I, I think he looks better with the beard better without the beard but um Daddy yeah it says it says married yeah he's obviously I think he's happily married to a redhead Oh my god! Uh, wow. Okay, if wow. it doesn't work out, wow. <laughs> but we wish them well. Of course, yeah. in hell. Yeah, no. I- <laughs> <laughs> but wait, I want to see if he's Jewish. He mm-hmm. looks like my kind. So Andrew Huberman is like that's so crazy. He's married to a redhead. When men yeah. like redheads enough to marry them, they'll date other redheads. People are saying he was probably Jewish. Yeah, I don't know if he's talked about it, but wow, that's so funny. Wow. Well, yeah. Just so, so you know, Andrew, like I would convert and we could be. You would together. convert for much less. Of I just course. mean for any Jew. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. the Jewish people. Yeah. 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 We'll I would you. convert we'll take for you much in. less. Yeah. I would probably convert just out of the blue. <laughs> the rabbi would be like, you have to like get married or something. Like, no, why you want to be a Jew? Convert. If I just kept, you have to go three times, right? Would you the have rabbi converted? denies you three times. Would you have converted for Harry and Sex in the City? Okay, here's the thing. Like, would you be with Harry? She was with Trey before yeah. she was with Harry. Yeah. So if I was Trey married, was the hot doctor, yeah, like good looking, so polished, rich, rich classy, gave her her like, apartment. Yeah. I believe that if I had been with Trey and he had been jerking off to uh, like Playboy magazines and not having yeah. sex with me, like he did to Charlotte, yeah. I would marry Harry too. If yeah. I was like 37, newly divorced, mm-hmm. And well, met, it's her divorce lawyer. Yes. And, well, and my divorce lawyer was Harry. And he was... <laughs> he, he was uh, do you want to explain that joke? Uh, what, that my mom married her divorce lawyer? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> I, Have I talked about that? Yeah. I don't my mom married her divorce lawyer. First, the first divorce. Yeah. Yeah. Because then she divorced the divorce lawyer. Because obviously... And who did she it. use as representation when she divorced the divorce lawyer? Him. No. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> I don't know. Some other one. Like, 
Uh, she was like, I'm not doing that again. No, no, no. And she was vulnerable. He was a bad guy. Oh, yeah, bad guy. But so would you convert for Harry? Yes. Okay. I wouldn't. Short answer, like, yes. I if I had it. if I had been married to Trey and I was 37 uh-huh. and I was Charlotte. He's a and Harry's a great guy. Harry's I love a funny guy. Like a truly uh-huh. funny guy. Yeah, not a guy who thinks he's, he's funny, type. which is most men. But not that he's your type, but he's more your type. My like, soul you, like, type. Yeah. Yeah, not yeah. my looks type. No, no. But you'd allow it. You like an If I was 37 guy. and divorced, yes. Yeah. The fresh meat that I am right now, it's so probably funny. not. His character in Californication is yeah. like such an animal. Like, really? so not Harry. Like, he's such an... He's like, yeah. That's like, the you know, uh, George Costanza. Yeah. Like, he always plays like the creepiest guys ever. Like, he, he like, never is not. What are you, are you playing the cool guy? No. Okay, let's get let's going. Get it, let's get it going. So the first one... Oh, the first one is that we would tell our drunk selves that you got to have some self-compassion, mm-hmm. homie. Yeah. You got to be a little bit nice to yourself. Meet yourself yeah. halfway. Yeah. It's, you know, so much of my drinking in my 20s and was because I was so hard on myself that it was like anything to escape the way I felt about myself, I would do. Mm. I wasn't having enough compassion um, for the things I'd gone through or just what I'm feeling. So I drink my sorrows and my self-pity away mm-hmm. and it would work for the an hour or two and then it was just mm-hmm. turmoil so I, yeah I wish I definitely had more compassion yeah I had a lot of shame around emotions my whole life and um so I would drink to numb emotions mm-hmm. and self-compassion played a big role for me because I um had to realize that like getting hurt or upset or feeling a certain way is okay. I would say that self-compassion played a really, really big role for me in my drinking issues because I felt a lot of shame around the way that I felt my whole life. Um, Like if I felt upset or if I felt really like any other feeling other than happy, I would drink to cope. Even feelings of vulnerability, I would drink to Mm -hmm. cope. So self-compassion played a really big role because I had a lot of shame around just feeling emotions Mm -hmm. um, themselves. I thought that like weak people felt emotions and I was strong because I was drunk a lot. And so when I, when I quit drinking, I had to have a lot of self-compassion because I had to realize that like it's okay to have feelings and be vulnerable and go through it sometimes sure. and sometimes you need to it's powerful lay in to bed all day or yeah and it's extremely powerful and you're not weak mm-hmm. you're the opposite of weak but even in my sobriety I've had to have compassion for myself I've really had I've to really work had on to, it yeah, yeah had to like grapple with the things that I did do and to know that like there were issues there I was struggling and that like that's okay because I stopped it yeah. and I, I made a change for the better for the betterment of me and the people around me but had to have compassion for that girl who was lost and sad and struggling. Yes. Um, so that came after. And that gives you self-awareness drinking. too, yeah. right? Yeah. Like I think I gained a lot of self-awareness from self-compassion mm-hmm. because being able to be like, okay, like maybe this is something you do all the time, like less judgment around what I'm doing or my patterns or yeah. whatever. It really helps you get out of the bad patterns. Yeah. And it was so easy to have compassion for other people. Like, I'm so quick to that, easily yeah. feel for others. But then when it came to myself, I was, like, the biggest critic and so hard on myself. And and then that would just drive me to drink. Mm-hmm. So I wish I could have gone back and said that to a younger version. But here we are now. I'm yeah. already learning it. Yeah. So I hope you can learn it right now. Yeah, self-compassion. And it's yeah. kind of ugly sometimes, mm-hmm. you know. So the second one. You are responsible for yourself. That's a big one, especially when you're drinking in your early 20s. And we're so used to, I don't know, obviously everyone's family dynamic is different, but we're used to being taken care of and everything kind of works out and your parents help you out. Like or it maybe. doesn't and you think it's everybody else's fault. Yeah. Or or you're used to everything not working out and blaming everybody yeah, else except yeah, yourself. Self-pity. Yeah. Like, Woe is me. Such a victim mentality. But it's like no one can do it for you. No one could like get you happy. And like I with my drinking being so bad for so many years, so many people tried, obviously my family and some friends to help me get sober. Mm-hmm. But like it wasn't until I realized that like I am responsible for what's going to happen no one else can do this for me they can they sent me to rehab paid all this money i wasn't ready for it like Mm -hmm. i didn't wasn't i wasn't willing to take responsibility 
for my life and my actions. So I wish I did sooner, obviously, something I learned. But if it's something I could tell you is like, just get ahead of that. Yeah. And like that you, I don't mean this in a way to make you feel lonely, but you are solely responsible for your own happiness in Mm -hmm. a way that it's like you are the gatekeeper to your own life. If someone's toxic, if someone's hurting you, it's your priority and job to gatekeep them out to not be around them. If someone puts you down, if you're in a toxic relationship, it's your responsibility to get out. It's your responsibility to curate your own life and the people in it and go for the goals and dreams that you want to. No one is going to magically make you happy. And I think I struggled a long time for my purpose too. Like I thought that if I'm being honest, like for a lot of my 20s, I was very lost and I gave up on my own dreams and Mm -hmm. I didn't believe in myself and I had extremely low self-esteem. And it didn't look like that, but I did when it came to my goals and dreams. Like I could look really pretty and go to the bar and look like confident because I guess I was confident in that arena. But when it came to like, Sky, do you think you're smart? Do you think you're Mm -hmm. capable? I I knew I was from school, but I was like, "Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just a dumb girl. (laughs) And I think that um, when I started to work on my self-esteem, I realized that like I had to have a purpose outside of just like men and drinking. Yeah. And for a long time, I think I thought that I would like marry some guy and then just he would be my purpose. Like I would never admit that as a feminist, but in my heart of hearts, that's what I thought when I was drinking a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like I was just waiting for a guy to come and like be my purpose eventually. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, I'll have kids, I'll get married and that'll Mm -hmm. be my purpose. Not that anything's wrong with that being your purpose, but for me, it was like a cop out for my real dreams and goals. that's sad. We're so, people are so used to just being like, well, I'm this way because of what happened to me and what, yeah. uh, how I grew up or how I was affected or what traumas I went through. But it's like, okay, that's, that's great. Those things happen, sad, whatever it is. But like, you have to be the one to do something about it. Yeah. You're the only person who can make a change, who could grow from that, learn from mm-hmm. it, better yourself. Like, no one's going to do it for you. No one's going to be like knocking on your door to like mm-hmm. make you better. And even like, I was lucky. I was blessed to have the support that I did to try to help me stop drinking yeah but it took it was so many tries going through stopping drinking or like lying to myself because I wasn't taking responsibility Mm -hmm. and it wasn't until finally I was like you know what Uh, what am I doing how many times am I going to repeat the same thing and expect it to be different I need to take action yeah and change the course here and I did and yeah that happened in 27 so later in my 20s but like if you're listening to this and you're younger you can just get ahead of it even if you're old like it doesn't matter any age but you have to be the one to make that decision. Nobody can yeah, do it for you. You have to do it. And yeah. you can have a support systems key, but you have to do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Forgiving others who hurt us. Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, forgiving others is a complicated thing. I think if someone, not everyone is worthy of forgiveness. I believe that some people are worthy of neutrality. So like they're not hurting you anymore, but you don't have them in your life and you accept that they are bad people, sure. that they are just the way that they are. They are bad people for whatever reason. You can have empathy for them. They had a bad upbringing. They did this. They did that. Okay. But some people are just shitty and will hurt. Mm-hmm. They like hurting others and it's important to keep them out of your life. Other people make mistakes. It's important yeah. to forgive them. Yeah. The way I see it is like the way I rank morality is in intentions. So it did somebody intend to do something they might have acted selfishly and had cons- some consideration about how it might affect you and still done it like that's selfish i think still sometimes forgivable if they like intended to hurt you mm. and especially if they know you and then that's not forgivable but you can still have compassion for them maybe or things they've gone through obviously it's like when you look at like s- extreme but when you look at serial killers or people who murder people like sure they've gone through some stuff they mm-hmm. maybe had a very traumatic upbringing or whatever so we can like have compassion for that child but we don't need to forgive them mm-hmm. they did horrific things to some people so some people absolutely you don't forgive but there are people who and you know hurt people hurt other people unless they work on themselves and do something about it so if you can see them like trying to make a change for the better then mm-hmm. yeah forgive them like i there's been people like let's say and when I was drinking who hurt me um and I had a grudge or whatever but it was it was poisonous to me right it wasn't 
it wasn't doing good for me mm -hmm. hating this person or hold harboring this resentment and so much so much anger it was just poisonous to me mm -hmm. so it's like forgiving them and moving on you sure you don't have to trust them as much have boundaries with these people it depends on your relationship with them right like you could you'll be the judge of that mm -hmm. but forgiveness is really liberating there's people definitely don't forgive some but some and some you don't want to harbor a grudge no. you can just be neutral you can like just be like i call I it just accepting that they are the way they are like you can just peacefully accept that someone yeah. is an asshole and yeah. that they wish people ill and that's an important thing to know that some people are just assholes in life yeah yeah but a lot of har harboring resentment and hate can also drive people to drink or to like numb that Absolutely. feeling around it and be like just so mad about it that they're so deep in their feels mm -hmm. that like they go and drink to yeah. escape and like that's not good either yeah. deal with it face it head on if that's internally or if that's like dealing with it with the person but drinking is not the answer and yeah like let's say it was like a part going to a party when you're younger and there's someone you knew you didn't like you'd get more drunk than you needed oh to God, probably that's so true right Why is like that? or you do something stupid or you get drunk mm -hmm. and then you act just angrily or you do something that's just like that's not who's benefiting here mm -hmm. you know take a step back and be like wait why am i drinking so much or why do i feel this way just deal with it mm -hmm. pull the trigger and kill him yeah <laughs> yep i agree okay don't kill anyone um all right uh the next one give therapy a try therapy yeah. is a really really useful tool yeah especially if you're like I knew something was wrong but I just thought it was all my fault I knew something was up with my mm -hmm. mental health and I thought it was all my fault and I the the best thing that I can say is like it's not your fault but it's your job and responsibility to heal that mm -hmm. stuff unfortunately mm -hmm. so therapies really helped me I wish that I started it in my earlier 20s I grew up in a house and in a culture I think like in Edmonton like it's a little rough and tumble that's why I'm wearing my Ed Hardy shirt like I'm just like <laughs> badass like that and like anyways but we I kind of grew up in a culture where there's a lot of shame about like seeing a shrink or like going to therapy like there was a lot of shame around it and mm. like only people who were like really mentally ill went to therapy even in high school, like unless like some chick had really bad anorexia, like everybody else had mm -hmm. eating disorders, you just kind of dealt with it. Like if you were going to a therapist over it or like if your family was going, like it was just like a lot of stigma in Edmonton about that stuff. I think it's just like Nordic hockey culture, like just really stoic, like tough guy kind of attitude. So I always was just like, no, that's like not for me. That won't even help. And it helped so much and it has grown my self-awareness and like it is for everyone. Everyone for has sure. shit. And if you can afford it, even for like six weeks, especially when you're drinking, it could really help you get to the root cause of why you're drinking, why you have yeah. these issues. And it's not your fault. And you deserve um, to be to have peace inside and to deal with it for sure. We we talk to our friends about our problems what we're going through we talk to our dumbass friends who like don't know anything they love yeah. us but they're biased and uneducated yeah. on the matter and, and just how to help shit going they have on. their own shit going on like they're coming at it yeah in a different way than a therapist would like this person's gone to school for a number of years they obviously are professionals they're going to be objective they don't they're not biased and they're just going to try to help you right like they don't have an agenda here it's mm -hmm. just to help you mm -hmm. so like what's the harm in that if we go to our friends and you can just then talk to somebody else who will actually help you in the right direction. So like, why is there stigma around it? Obviously society has made it so. So I have a different experience with therapy being Jewish. Like obviously it's more accepted in the community and people go to it. Like so many Jews are therapists and mm -hmm. it's just people go, like we talk about things. Oh, you guys are so resilient. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, obviously there's been a lot there, but even still it was stigma stigmatized for me and like I would go to therapy as a kid because of some stuff and then I went in my my family made me go in my when I was 22 because of my drinking but I wasn't using it as a useful tool so much I would go and I would talk but I was in denial so I wasn't being honest so something I definitely suggest like if you are doing it and maybe that's because I didn't have value in it I wasn't paying for it like I wasn't ready mm -hmm. so like I was not being honest and then that's a waste right and we all do it you go to the doctor and they say how many drinks a week do you have 
everyone's lying for whatever reason like no one's being honest yeah. with these people and they don't care they're just trying to help you like they, they might like because everyone's so worried about judgment everyone's worried their doctor's gonna judge you and they might they might kind of have a bit of a reaction because they're just like get it together let me help you but my therapist i wasn't i wasn't being honest and also maybe it wasn't the best fit and that's also a thing i think is a reality with it like some people go and they don't, they don't jive with the person and then mm-hmm. they think well the therapy's not for me it's like well no that's not the mm-hmm. case you just need to kind of play around maybe shop around for the right person it's definitely an investment but mm-hmm. it's like worth it all because it's going to be the stepping stones to changing your life or it could be some of yeah. the stepping stones to changing your life. And now I'm in therapy again and like loving it and at a different place in my mind. But if I could go back to that 22 year old self right before going to rehab, I wish I could have just like shaken her and been like, be honest with your therapist, put value into what you're doing. I was going, I was showing up and I would leave feeling better, but I would still, I just wasn't and you ready. you deserved to- it. I think it's like part of it is like, you feel like you don't deserve like when we lie, it's like there's like just shame and and mm-hmm. low self esteem around that too. It's like I don't deserve to have you hold space or like you can't mm-hmm. actually help me because I can't be helped. And it's this like hopelessness yeah. Yeah. shame yeah, spiral yeah, totally. that you can go down. I think, um, and like I'll just deal with it over here on my own with my drinking problem. I think mm-hmm. that that's like kind of part of it too. Like why yeah. we don't want to? Because I would get like I would read so many self help books. Like we were joking like. Mm-hmm. I would read so many self-help books and online quotes or podcasts or whatever. And like, they probably like were saying some truth to me, but I would never actually like look it in the yeah. eye and be like, this yeah. is what I need to do we ready for until it. it got to the point where I was like, I need to look this in the eye. Yeah. I need to yeah. change my life. Yeah. So therapy, great tool. Mm-hmm. Try mm-hmm. it. Like, and especially with men. So there's such a stigma around men going in that it's a, it's a sign of weakness and yeah. it's like no it's the opposite it's a sign of strength that you want to better yourself like what's wrong with that definitely the opposite all right the next one stop caring what people think so this yeah. one is huge especially if you're trying to quit and everyone's an asshole to you and they act like you're some kind of freak because you're denying a drink mm-hmm. when guys want to buy you a drink or when girls want to buy you a drink like whatever and you're just like no thanks like I actually don't drink and then they're assholes it's really important to just not care what people think well so many people and myself included before getting sober and quitting drinking I was so scared about how others would perceive me me. as if that matters it doesn't and obviously I know that now and even in my earlier 20s like that was something that I was so affected by was what people thought about me and this was while I was drinking I cared so much about the opinions of others or just you know I grew up I was super insecure for so many years and issues there so I did try to reframe how I thought Mm. or how I dealt with people's opinions like I stopped like it became a mantra I was like I don't care it doesn't matter what people think and so I did work on that while I was drinking but even still even thereafter I still cared because I was thinking about what they would think of my sobriety when it's like why would their opinions about me bettering my life if they're not good opinions who cares Mm -hmm. who cares what they have to say you're just so like in your head about other people and you just put off doing what's best for you and now obviously what we're both three years sober and we don't care about people's opinions but even when they do come at us if someone does have something to say negatively about our mm-hmm. sobriety or whatever it's like they're so- telling us something about themselves this has nothing to do yeah. with us i definitely like still struggle with people's opinions i think but i yeah i definitely still struggle i think with mm-hmm. people's opinions it's something that i'm working on now but at first it was like i was so afraid of not fitting in with everybody yeah that I think I was terrified of quitting drinking because I felt like I tried to quit a couple times and I had felt that isolation from people when I like would say like, oh no, I'm mm-hmm. not drinking right now. I'm doing a challenge or whatever. Like I would say, and I felt that isolation. So I was terrified of doing it. And even now I like don't really live a very conventional life in a lot of ways. And sometimes I like feel shame about that. And I'm like working oh. through that for sure. Yeah. The conventional, but in ways of like, just like like I'm not married in Edmonton with kids like I'm kind of just doing my own thing I like really like I'm so happy that I'm doing my own thing I'm living my truth but I feel like my entire life sometimes choosing to be alcohol free choosing to pursue acting choosing to live the life that I want to live and like be happy I feel like pisses people off sometimes you know what I mean and so and sometimes I care about that and I'm like oh like 
they don't like me because of it. Or like sometimes when drunk people tell me at work, like they'll be like, oh, you're so fucking lame or whatever. Like I do shake it off most of the time, but like in the summertime, it's really frequent and it's pretty jarring. Wow. You know, yeah, that's rough. Yeah. It's like, fuck those people. Of who- course, fuck yeah. those people. But it's also like, and also I have to say this and this is judgmental of me, but I'm going to be honest. Like the coolest people, like CEOs, like people who I look up mm-hmm. to always are like, that is so fucking yeah. cool that you don't drink. But sometimes like the party or losers are really rude and like I know that they're losers to be honest like I do when they act like that I'm like you are an active addiction and you're a fucking loser but I still am like I don't want to hear this all the time no of course of course it's like annoying and like obviously like you just don't need to deal with it like I'm sorry you go through that but it's like it's always from people that don't matter like their opinions yeah their opinion doesn't matter but sometimes it's jarring especially like working where I work and yeah yeah. and being in the scene still like but then like the money's so good it allows me to do this so it's it's complicated right yeah life isn't perfect no no and of course like we're human so don't beat yourself up if you do get affected by what people somebody has to say but like especially when you're drinking it's so easy to just drink it drink that away if you yeah. if someone judged you or said something that you oh, didn't absolutely. like or like and made fun of you whatever it is everyone will always judge you no matter who you yeah. are they'll always judge you it just doesn't matter all right the next one you can achieve anything you put your mind to a, cli- a cliche a cliche but it's true including sobriety right if it's something you're in active addiction your drinking is bad you can get sober even when you think it's like the hardest thing or you could never it could you could just never actually take the plunge and do it like you can you can do anything Mm, and you know what going back to earlier when we talked about andrew huberman Mm -hmm. and how i i learned it i think i heard andrew huberman talk about it i don't know where you you heard it but like when dopamine's released in your brain when you talk about doing the things instead of doing the things that can especially be true for manifesting. And that's one of the dangers of manifesting mm-hmm. is I try to focus on manifesting is not only manifesting my goals, but also doing the actions to show it's the both. universe that I'm ready. Yeah, it's both. Because some of the new wave like manifestation coaches and et cetera, et cetera, can encourage you to just speak about it all the time and never take action. Yeah. And then you just will, you just will be stuck in yeah. the third gear. You can't move. Totally. So well, I think like you, that that's another is, thing about like, you can put anything, you, yeah. you, you, you can do anything that you want to do if you set your mind to it, but you just have to start. And it's cringe yeah. and embarrassing to start, but you just like, yeah. you have to fucking do it's it. It's like, you have to put your intention and your thought into it. You yeah. speak it. And then you also take action. You actually show mm-hmm. up as all of these things and then it will come back tenfold. You can't just be speaking about it. And like I applied this in my I grew up overweight and there was always a voice in the back of my head that was like, this isn't the life for you. Like mm. you're going to lose the weight one day. You're going to be fit. But I would I would just put it off. I would just keep just sat in my sorrows and and drank and ate and whatever. And then, OK, one day I cold turkey made the decision like I'm losing the weight. I did it. Mm-hmm. So that was huge to be like, OK, I can I achieved what I set my mind to. But then I was still drinking heavily and binging and, you know, still wasn't like healing from certain things. But then it was always, in the, especially in the depths of the hangovers, was like, you're going to get sober one day. Like, you cannot really? live like this. Yeah, I, the truth would always come out in the the lowest points, you know, especially like, I don't know what it was like for you, but because of how bad it was for me, it's constantly two voices in your head. One being yeah. like the addict that just takes over and just makes you drink and do the bad things. And then the one, the voice of reason, who maybe oh. is your truest self, is like trying to like help you and is being like, you're killing yourself you're you're destroying your body your organs you're throwing your life away in those moments and until one day it was like something has to change I can do it I can do it you can do it you just have to like fully make that decision like nobody can do it for you like we said in the point before anyone who's done anything who started a business who's done all of these things they can do whatever they want but they actually just did it yeah that's the key and but I think also we don't talk enough about like success coaches and all the bullshit you know they don't talk enough about how uncomfortable starting something is Mm -hmm. and like the first bit is really cringe if you're overweight and you're hitting the gym you're gonna feel uncomfortable and cringe in the gym for the first however long Mm -hmm. if you're um if you're starting a new job if you're learning a new skill like you will feel just embarrassed for some reason and cringe and uncomfortable because in growth, it's really uncomfortable. So you can literally do anything. And I think the biggest warrior like like that you have to defeat 
in that is just discomfort. And I'm always defeating discomfort even mm-hmm. now because mm-hmm. I keep, it's not about quitting drinking now for me. It's about setting other goals. And I have felt like I always feel that discomfort when I first start yeah, and then I get course. more used to it. And then, but then it's like, now there's a new goal and you're uncomfortable there. For and sure. it's new and but it's that's scary. just growth. Like when yeah, we first course. started and like you've obviously had training for most of your life and how to speak and talk mm-hmm. to a camera and you know, just yeah. being an actor where I have not so yeah. like ta- sitting here and like with a microphone and a camera and being super vulnerable and yeah. just ta- is so uncomfortable I was yeah. so nervous at the beginning and like it still is early yeah but you just have to do it you just have to get over it putting yourself out there trying to setting goals and like trying to reach them you're going to be uncomfortable you're going to yeah. be it's a lot of change but like you can do it I love Nike's like logo just do it like it's the best because it's like just fucking do it just do it whatever you want just do it just go do it it sounds so easy but like you can do it but it's only from within yeah okay next one for all my drunkies out there or everyone needs to know this especially Mm -hmm. if you're under 30 that healing takes Mm -hmm. time and it's a process just like sobriety is a process yeah oh yeah um and this one can be frustrating (laughs) Well, we're constantly evolving and changing as beings and and every nothing is just gonna be perfect no. suddenly. Right? Like so getting sober, a lot of people do freak out. Maybe you're in early sobriety, they do feel lonely, bored. A lot of anxiety and depression comes up still. But that's because it's a process. It's not just like some event that happens. You don't just get sober and suddenly you're fixed there are reasons probably why you had drinking problems Mm -hmm. that need to be resolved and worked on which is also why early sobriety i think so many of the tiktok comments we get right now are like i feel terrible i don't feel better i feel terrible you promised me (laughs) it would feel better everybody promised me i'd feel better and i feel fucking terrible and i think that's that's yeah. like it's, it's so normal. true and I, I I also think like for me when I first quit drinking I had this period this honeymoon phase with it where I just felt so much better physically I was finally sleeping all of these good things and then um unfortunately it like all hit me um mm-hmm. that I'd been kind of numbing my emotions for like mm-hmm. 10 years and that I needed to deal with it and that part of it um, was really really hard and it was a huge process but I mm-hmm. conquered it and it was mm-hmm. a big challenge and I think now when I the way that I see life is like it is hard you have to accept that it's hard and you yeah. have to see yourself as like this underdog that works really hard and is willing to conquer these things because yeah. other otherwise you'll just you'll drown in them you'll mm-hmm. you'll let it kill you yeah it's easy I think it's common for people to kind of spiral in early sobriety and similar to changing that getting sober for me was like I said when I lost all that weight at Mm -hmm. about 20 I thought I'd lose the weight reach my goal and like everything I'd feel happy and then when that didn't happen and this is common especially in like with rapid weight loss Mm -hmm. is that like you get there and suddenly you're just still unhappy and then it like really spirals you into like deeper unhappiness depression anxiety because you're like well then fuck I'm just a miserable person so then that would just fuel me to drink more and all of the things so sim- similar to when you get sober, it's not the solution to your happiness. Alcohol was just a byproduct of that. You were just using this thing to numb and, and run away from those things. Mm-hmm. But your problems that you had are going to be there in an early sobriety yeah. until you then work on it. Um, but don't don't beat yourself up over that. Don't let that stop you from getting sober because you're scared to face these feelings and whatever, maybe some traumas or things that you need to heal on. Like don't let that stop you Mm -hmm. right it's gonna there's gonna it's gonna be waves up and down but like overall it's gonna be so much better getting out yeah and if you have been hurt like let's say you went through a breakup or whatever um or even you're like I feel so awful especially for this generation with their situationships like Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of people in their early 20s and they're in so many situationships and it's awful because it's like they fall in love with these people and but there's like no verbiage to use for the weight of how heartbroken they are yeah. so then and they drink and use substances to like yeah because they up. don't see the relationship through so then it's like mm-hmm. they drink and use substances to like try to heal it but it's not healing it and they need to just realize that like they fell in love with this person and that they were manipulated and it's really sad and they have to fully be heartbroken for a little bit and then get over it men and women like you see it on both sides and it's super super sad yeah. 
the worst time to be drinking is when you're going through it but that's oh, when people do do yeah so yeah it's a rough one but just you know have compassion for yourself it takes yeah. time self-compassion yep the next one is health is wealth health baby. is wealth baby oh yeah i don't know why we have to say baby after but it's so natural oh yeah baby baby oh baby, baby. but health is wealth okay mm-hmm. it just is it's not the only measure of health but it is so take care of your body you know i was having liver pains kidney pains and i know i'm not the only one i was drinking like poisoning Mm -hmm. my body on the regular just treating my body like it didn't matter Mm -hmm. and my brain all of it and for what like for what yeah and i also think it's just so important to i think i learned this when i quit drinking how your body is your mental health and your mental health Mm -hmm. is your body like i sound like an idiot but it's like it's one in the same same. when you take care of your body the way that your mental health is positively affected is insane like a lot of the time you just need exercise you need sunlight you need water you're just a complicated plant with emotions like that's all and i wish that i had known it was that simple i think i was in a horrible environment just drinking so much partying so much like feeling so empty inside wondering why I felt so empty inside and it was just important for my for me to remove myself from that environment and Mm. I'm way better and that's just like as simple as that I think putting a depressant into your body and wondering why you're so depressed and unhappy yeah when I lost the weight then suddenly I'm eating so healthy I'm caring so much about what I'm putting into my body but then poisoning myself yeah three or four days of the week with alcohol destroying my liver and my organs my brain just how i see myself but like i was like uh i gotta get my vegetables in like gotta, really it's like, yeah or i would like stay away from taking tylenol or like medications as much as i could but then i was like my mom would be like what the fuck like she'd like offer to give me like tylenol for something or whatever and i'd be like no i'm not taking that but then i'm like literally chugging a mickey vodka oh my god ridiculous ridiculous and i'm not the only person who's like that like so no. many people pick and choose but it's like uh, just stop. that is crazy yeah that's like one time i when i was a stampede i was with this girl and she was like on a full cocaine bender right mm-hmm. doing blow like the whole weekend and i was eating a hot dog at the rodeo and she looks at me and she's like d- with disgust for me eating a hot dog and she's like how do you put that in your body and i was like you've literally done random guys cocaine all weekend yeah you don't even know like the fucking methamphetamine that you put in your body all weekend yeah i didn't say that i was like i just eat it it's a Mm -hmm. hot dog but like in my head i was like i don't like it it's so funny people will always have something to say about what we're doing always always like the most unhealthy people will like say shit to me about my choices my veganism whatever it is and i'm like what is it? what is that that you're eating like yeah. could you even tell me the ingredients in it probably 100 but but yeah and like i also think that you know a, a short walk is better than nothing a little workout is better than nothing a vegetable is better than nothing and yeah. if you're you know one drink is better than 10 drinks so mm-hmm. figure it out yeah. and exercise just baby steps key. exercise key. all the things like so much for your mental health your physical health all of it mm-hmm. like treat your body like a temple it is the only home that you have every single day yeah so treat it as such yeah i mean drinking (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah uh people come and go that's our ninth one so um this one is really tough and i'm where i think we'll learn this one until we're 90 years old to be honest i think this is a life i mean it's a yeah people will come and go from your life like everyone's gonna die so like for sure everyone's (laughs) going (laughs) they've they've already come some have already come they're all going okay you're yeah, going to yeah so like that's a hard thing to accept it might be part of why people drink because of the act the realities of life and death is so scary yeah the sooner we accept that everything is temporary the better off you are so friends there might be party friends people even good friends best friends that have come into your life maybe you've lost them mm-hmm. but that's just life and that's okay it's a hard pill to swallow mm-hmm. but it's just what it is and some people aren't meant to be in your life forever some people serve a lesson they come in for a time and they serve their purpose and then they go and it's sad and then you'll go through a bit of struggle but then it just opens up the door for mm-hmm. another person who's going to better serve your life and yeah. love you 
some people are meant for a chapter and then some people go for a couple chapters and some people come back and it's just it's kind of a vibe that way and i i also think that when i quit drinking i wish that i knew that like you had a lot of really supportive friends i didn't so much Mm -hmm. um and but then they're not meant for you and it's and i knew that but it was really hard at the time so i just want to speak on that like for sure it's It can be really, really hard and isolating at first when your friends don't accept that you don't want to drink anymore and they are drinking. But I think it's just really important to like hang out by yourself and know and have faith that you will make new friends. You don't need to force it. You will make new friends and like it will be okay. And it's okay to be lonely in this chapter. So many people, I think, put off quitting drinking because they're scared of the friends they might lose mm-hmm. or what their social circle or dynamic. That's a big is going fear that like. people tell it's me huge. in my DMs Massive. when like, they talk to yeah, me about it. Massive. Yeah, and I can I can totally sympathize and empathize with that because yeah. it's like that is a scary thought. But like the people, and even you went through it, and you experienced some friends loss, and mm-hmm. some people came and went. But like that's okay because they're not meant for you and some of it if i'm being honest some friends wanted to still be in my life Mm -hmm. and then we had nothing in common Mm -hmm. i also realized they're like party friends more than anything we we just had nothing Nothing, in common and when i was more emotionally regulated i had nothing to talk about which is also a shitty thing uh like with them yeah, like I I just have nothing to talk about with them. It's like I don't like I don't cause drama with guys anymore. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. black and white for me. Like if a guy did me dirty, I'm not talking to him again if it's past the point of my boundaries. If it's not, then we have some communication to do between yeah. the two of us. But like I don't really need to involve my girlfriends in like every fucking aspect of my bullshit now because I'm not I think before, you know, they always say drunk texts or sober thoughts and I could not disagree with that more now. And I used to wonder in my early sobriety, like, what was that? What was I doing mm-hmm. with the drunk text or sober thoughts was thing? Like, like some why of was like I texting? Addicted to the chaos. I That's what it is. I was uh-huh. bored. Yeah. I had nothing going on in my life. And I was addicted to the Just chaos. Now, if someone started shit with me or if there's drama, I don't have time. In, like, in my mind, like, I'm memorizing lines for this audition. We have this podcast this week. I'm working these days. I, I want to hit the gym. I want to be hanging out with friends that love me and support me and have fun. Fun. I want to be laughing and enjoying life to the fullest. I I have time for necessary drama, but like that bullshit, I don't have time for it in my brain. Mm-hmm. I actually just don't have time for it in my brain. So I did lose some friends because I didn't have that like, and then I texted him and then I was hooking up with his friend, but he was hooking up with my friend. Isn't that fucked? Isn't he evil? And it's like, well, weren't you hooking up with his friend too? And they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, but... Uh, so, so, and then we went to marble and then we and oh. I just can't fucking listen to it and I feel bad because it does sound like I'm a judgmental cunt but like I kind of am I don't have as much headspace to deal with that stuff that I and that used to be my whole life so I guess it's not judgmental because like I I was that guy pretty fucking mm-hmm. hard for a solid few years so it's just where they're at but I mm-hmm. I find like the people come and go thing it's like when you experience a metamorphosis and you want to change your life and you do when you accomplish those things you'll you'll some people just won't be along for the ride mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know it's just what it is yeah and if you're addicted to chaos it. and you get unaddicted to chaos uh, it's really hard when you shared chaos with people yeah and sometimes it's still fun I watch reality TV yeah, for like, 90 Day like Fiance. Vanderpump, uh, I'm addicted to it. Rules. Yes, Mama. it's so fun. Yeah, I love it in celebrities and professionals. Yeah. And I love knowing like Just the crazy gossip. But like yeah. when I can't like hang out with you and have you like, I don't want to be Andy Cohen on this couch listening to you be I like, I would love that. Like, like, tell me, I'm like, tell me everything. Spill the fucking yeah. tea. I like it when it's I'm removed yeah, from it, but me. I wouldn't want to be in that me. life. Or like anyone too close to me. I don't want yeah, to yeah, that's what it. I'm saying. It's course, like, I wouldn't want to be on the couch with yeah. it. I want to like watch NeNe Leaks in my bed at 1 a.m. Yeah. eating yeah. popcorn. Like, But yeah, you're definitely going to lose friends in sobriety. When you're drunk, you just hold on to things or you're just like, oh, whatever. You let things slide yeah. because you're drunk. And it's like, well, some people's behaviors maybe not okay or yeah maybe they're just not actually a friend like you just party together you yeah. just both use each other to be addicts yeah absolutely like so that is that really a friend you might lose them in your sobriety you might lose good friends people might judge you there might be people who you're not expecting it from yeah. that will pass judgment or not be the kindest yeah. cut them out like i don't know just be savage do what's right for you 
people hold on to people for memories and because you have years together and you do love them but like that's not a good enough reason to have them in your life like if you don't have things in common if they bring you down in certain ways if they're not like helping you with your goals and they're just Mm -hmm. feeding that addict in you or whatever the the person who's making bad decisions like cut them out cut them out bye yeah all right last last but not least we just did a whole episode on this so if you'd like to hear more we did an episode on loneliness Mm -hmm. yeah we're so lonely and drinking yeah only sap yeah started drinking because of loneliness a lot of it yeah and then was really lonely (laughs) during yeah and then was really lonely during uh drinking and then some people might experience loneliness you i was lonely loneliness yeah. after drinking for some time but that's okay loneliness is a part of life it sucks mm-hmm. but you can get through it and i just wish i could have told my younger drunk self that like it's okay and if you're lonely like deal with it mm-hmm. rather than like numbing it and escaping with drinking mm-hmm. or like getting drunk because i'm like lonely and just like going on dates with guys or mm-hmm. just filling voids yeah i would say like you can there's a lot of coping mechanisms with loneliness alone i i still struggle with loneliness for sure like just like i'm constantly working towards my goals and i'm hyper focused and i know it'll pay off but i also struggle with loneliness like i wish i could waste more time um and i had more time to waste and i've i've realized now like I'm trying to find a balance of like working really, really hard and getting the things I need to get done done mixed with having a night off and hanging out with people and having fun. And and that's a hard balance for me. I'm like very much a workaholic with my sobriety Mm -hmm. Um, and that can be self-destructive and all of the things too. So like I'm, I'm fine. I'm on a journey, you guys. Mm -hmm. Just I'm here with you. So there's always stuff that comes up and I think that there's coping mechanisms for it. You don't need to live a life of extreme loneliness. You're a nice person. Chances are. And I think it's important to realize that you can maybe try to find comfort, find comfort in loneliness. Mm -hmm. If you are experiencing feelings of loneliness, that's a good time to then nurture Mm -hmm. like the inner child or nurture yourself. Do some self-care things because you will feel less lonely when you know that you have yourself. Yeah. But when I was drinking, oh my God, I was doing anything to just escape. If it was a Tuesday, I was messaging anyone, whoever, to go out, go to a bar. And that was just like my night instead of just like facing what I was going through, mm. working on my traumas or my issues or, you know, all of it. I was just escaping. What would you say to finish it off? What would you say in like two sentences, one to two sentences to that girl? Um, As you now, if you could time travel back, what would you say? I would say like it's okay it's not your fault and you will be okay mm. but like fucking do it <laughs> do it no one's gonna do it for you do it yeah what would you say i would say you are so much stronger than you think and you think you think that you're weak but you're the opposite mm-hmm. and just fucking do it just, <laughs> and you need to do it, do it. <laughs> just go just go fucking do it my please, fav- one of my favorite Fuck. movies goodwill hunting yeah yeah watch goodwill hunting because it's, it's yeah. such it pulls in your heartstrings and it's not he's not an addict in it but like he does bad things to himself yeah just self-destructive yeah destructive he doesn't behavior. believe in himself doesn't believe himself not reaching his potential because of his upbringing and he needed to know from robin williams that it, it's not his fault yeah it's not his fault he had to forgive forgive yeah. forgive forgive but oh, love that movie but yeah, just it. don't be hard on yourself. Like it's hard your 20s or even whenever you're drinking. It could be you could be older than that. You could be younger, but like it doesn't mm-hmm. need to be you forever. You can no, get you through can it. change it anytime. We had a lady comment this morning on our yeah. TikTok that she was 70 How years cute. old. And I was like, you fucking Yes, girl. fuck yes. It's never too late. It's never too late. Ever. It's like when never I, too late. When I was in rehab, there were people who were 18 and there was someone like in their 70s. Yeah. Like it's never too late to ask for a better life and make the change yeah but do it before it gets later yes right i hope you took away something from this felt a little less alone felt a little more seen Mm -hmm. i hope you found some tools some things yeah i don't know i'm gonna go google naked pictures of andrew huberman you think they'd be out there i'm gonna go to my room for he's probably got a hog on him 
like let's be real you think andrew huberman has a big penis yes yes don't you i've just been trying to get through this episode so we can talk about andrew huberman don't you think he would there's no way he does yeah he has yeah there's big no dick way energy he yeah he's got he big has dick energy big brain big dick energy yeah. that's my ultimate crush andrew huberman i think about it all the time wow yeah. oh he's like my ultimate yeah he's like a like could you call him a celebrity crush yeah who's your biggest celebrity sober sober celebrity crush Theo Vaughn or Andrew oh, Huberman. Okay. Is I don't Andrew think Andrew Huberman, Huberman drinks. He always says bad things about alcohol, yeah, which yeah. also I like. But it'd be interesting. He should. I wish he talked more about himself. He like, be like yeah, I wish yeah. he talked more about himself. Right? Because it's like, you'd be like, okay. so He's, he's just this. telling us how to yeah, live our best just, life. It's like, well, what about you, Andrew? Yeah. Tell me about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know who my biggest crush would be. Enough about me. More Bradley about Cooper. You. Jason Bateman. Yeah. But Jason Bateman's not like. Jason Bateman's like not like hot. He's not like, like I just like, yeah. But like if you were married to him, like. Bradley like, Cooper is like. Bradley Cooper. Yeah, he's great. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think Zac Efron might be sober. Yeah. I, Zac Efron without the filler. Oh. Yeah. I mean, what did he do there? I know. It's so sad. It's so, so sad. Because somebody did that to him. Somebody did that to him. Some fucking he said it doctor. Was an act. He got into an act. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you we didn't. Do both. We all know. <laughs> I know. I was like, exactly. Like, Zach, come We've on. known you since we were 11. Yeah. Or 10. Yeah. Like, we know. You know what's funny? I saw this thing recently about Lucy Hale talking about her sobriety because she's yeah. sober. And then I remembered, like, actually, the night that I met Zach Efron, I also met her at this club in LA. Yeah. And I was so drunk, like, being a yeah degenerate yeah and i saw her and met her and i was like are you drunk right now and she was like very like taken up she was like what like no and i was like who cares like we're all everyone's drunk like such a loser thing like that's what you said something like that <laughs> and she was probably sober at the time or maybe struggling or something like and it's like i know obviously don't know i'm just meeting some celebrity then like, how old were you like 19 like oh my okay i'm yeah. like that's like i hope this I was wasn't research no of course not <laughs> like i hope this wasn't past i was just 21. like i was just like being like oh my god like whatever like being yeah so, like we're all partying together like you're drunk like i don't even yeah I don't no even i remember that. when i was 19 i said shit like that she, all the time and she's like yeah who the fuck are you probably like asking yeah i'm drunk yeah she, maybe she was struggling at the time <laughs> <laughs> okay we're gonna wrap it up we love you guys love see you, you next week see you next week peace out a town bye <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Thanks for tuning in with us today. We're going to be talking about our kombucha we've been drinking mm -hmm. on today's episode. Rise. How do you like that? Fresh ginger. Let's crack this baby open. So this is a company from Montreal, Quebec. Started by two friends. I love that. Oh, it didn't have a satisfying Did not crackle. Have uh, but... What is this one? Fresh ginger kombucha, low sugar, a lot of live active culture. Yeah. This one's like low in sugar, has even some fiber, three billion living cultures. That's a lot of millions. 50 cals for the whole bottle. Okay. I'll be honest. This one isn't my favorite. I get nervous I like drinking kombucha. Why? I bought this kombucha thinking that I was going to become a kombucha person. I like the Tonica one from uh, Toronto. No, this one's good. It's just not my favorite brand, but it is. I do enjoy it. It's just never the one I go for. But like, it's a classic ginger kombucha. I like it. Mm -hmm. Got good fizz. Good fizz. Yeah. And started by two friends in Montreal. Yeah. And this podcast started by two friends. Thanks so much for tuning in with us this week. Hope you enjoyed. And we'll be back next week with a whole new episode. Bye. Bye.